Hello everybody. Just uh, typing you a couple messages before we start up here. Um, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good myself. Let's see here. Alright everybody. Um, I know that people are signing in. Let me just give you a little bit of background before we start. You see, I'm all buck out. Um, what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to submit questions as I'm answering questions. I will be making announcements through this week. The reason I talked about uh, how busy I was last week, simply because I, I got it done. I'm going to submit for a million dollar grant in the fall um, to open up a new charter school down in Homestead in Florida City, uh, allowing athletes the opportunity to um, pursue college and uh, drive down levels of violent crime down in the region, particularly in Florida City, which is right now a, a hotbed. But in any case, um, I will be giving you announcements through the week so that um, more like probably expect the announcements Wednesday and Thursday just to guide you through the end of the semester. I know that some of you are really concerned about grades and all that. I'll be grading things uh, after Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You'll have all your grades on Sunday. Uh, but right now at this point, I would say don't don't worry too much about it. It's been a kind of a crazy semester, a crazy summer. So based upon that, I'll be very fair, especially since I've had a major project coincide with a major transition. So trust me, uh, believe me, I will take care of you, and we'll we'll do the best we can. Um, the end of the semester will be very fair. I can't believe this is week four, and basically next week is the last week of classes. Um, bizarre, right? And then the, fun, the week after that is final exams, and I have some surprises in store for you. Um, so as we get ready, I know that I expect that there's going to be some, and I don't know why the, um, the chat's not working. Uh, let me just see. I'm going to do a testing here real quick. But your questions, I received your questions for, and someone answer me if you can, where you see I'm testing. Uh, the question that you submitted on Dear Mama, oh my gosh, I know it has to do... Uh, it's going to prepare you for uh, your forthcoming assignment. But man, some of your questions, let me tell you what, why are you asking no man such hard questions is what i got to say. Um, I do expect for some people to be tuning in from Facebook and other places based upon, you know, a lot of people have actually read this particular book. Um, so I'm just going to kind of free flow through it. If you are able to submit to me a, um, a chat, a chat question, please do. I may not get it because it says up here that I'm unable to connect to chat, which has been very frustrating. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get in contact with YouTube and find out why there's any kind of problems this way. Um, I will tell you that uh, on the live classes, when I do answer these questions that pertain to Dear Mama, I will tell you that it is very emotionally difficult to uh, walk through the questions and fire off. So, you know, it is possible I might get teary-eyed. It's possible I might cry. I don't know. Uh, I've become more in tune with myself ever since I started watching My Hero Academia. I know that's kind of bizarre, right? But uh, I watched My Hero Academia with my daughters. And for some reason, if you watch it, Deku is my boy. And every, or every episode, I end up crying over Deku. But I will say this. Deku is a very fascinating character simply for the fact that he has no business ever being a superhero. He doesn't have a quirk, which is a, a skill or a talent. And he gets his skill or talent from All Might. Uh, the ultimate number one superhero and he but even without his quirk he's always fighting always fighting to be the best be the best be the best and I had to make a decision today um, that it, it cost me money which is an investment in myself but I had to make a decision today and I made the decision as if I was a cartoon character I'm like oh my gosh what's my life coming to um, but it ends up it was a life-changing type of decision and the life-changing decision really was is I decided that even though I can speak professionally, I don't have any problem standing in front of a crowd, um, I've decided to work with Les Brown um, in a mentoring project where I had to invest a little bit of money so that I could get one-on-one uh, -on -one tutelage. And this is directly uh, tied to Dear Mama because one of you, and I can't remember who it was, I have, I have like 150 questions here. Obviously, I'm not going to go through them. I put asterisks next to some of the more important ones. But one of you... Uh, asked the question, um, what was it like having Maya Angelou give you the advice to actually write this book? And it's just, <laughs> it's fascinating because those of you who don't know, Maya Angelou is one of the greatest authors, uh, black female authors, 
to ever live. She was a poet, she was an actress, she was a dancer, she was a teacher, she was, you know, she was really everything. And <laughs> for those of you who wonder how uh, Maya Angelou gave me the advice to write the book, it wasn't called Dear Mama back then, it was called Mama. Um, the idea was called Mama. And so here's how it happened. It was all, it, it's funny how they, they say that, you know, success isn't based upon skill necessarily. And it's definitely not based upon luck. But like Oprah says, what success, success happens when opportunity, or when, um, when preparation meets opportunity. And it just so happened, um, I was asked to, when my senior year in college, I was in an English class, a creative writing English class, uh, with Dr. Tony Stoneburner. And we were having protests over race, not, not much different than it is today, but on campus, at Denison's campus, we were having sit-ins based upon there had been a very racialized incident on campus. One of my best friends had been accosted, and oh, there was all kinds of complications. And we sat in, and we had national press coverage from Newsweek and Time, and NBC, CBS, all the major outlets were there. And so we're going through these protests. Just before they started, we were in uh, English class, and I was telling them about my background with Mama Green, but, you know, I'm in a predominantly white school, 62 African Americans at the school, and there are 2,100 students total, so it was a very small population. And in our senior, senior year, I was sitting there telling the story about Mama Green in my English class, and Dr. Stone, well, everyone was kind of mesmerized. They had no idea that what my background was, and they fired a bunch of questions, much like you have today. Um, and then I delivered a speech in front of all these cameras, there were about 1,500 people out there, and I delivered this speech on the impact that Mama Green had had. So about a week after the protests had taken place, Maya Angelou had been invited to Denison's campus. And Lisa Coleman, who ended up being the uh, chief diversity officer at Harvard, and then later chief diversity officer at New York University, which I believe she's still there. She was two years ago. She invited me. She said, Sean, you want to come? Uh, and so did the professors. You want to come have dinner with Maya Angelou? And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, dinner? free dinner, where's that? And they go to Buxton, which is like the five-star restaurant in Granville, Ohio. I said, yeah, I'll go to dinner. I said, who's my Angela? I don't even know who she is, you know, but I said, yeah, I'll go to dinner. And so, <laughs> and she's world famous, and now she's exceptionally world famous, but back then, I didn't know. I was, I was studying sociology all the time, I'm writing a 270-page senior research thesis. I don't have time to read anything else, let alone know who this person is. So, we go down the hill. Um, Denison's up on top of a great big hill, and the Buxton was at the bottom of the hill at this beautiful restaurant in this small, quaint little New England type town. <laughs> and, and so we go to dinner and I'm sitting here and Lisa's sitting over here next to me on my left. And my Angelo, very meek, very quiet, but she had one of those quiet voices that would carry. And so she starts telling her story and I'm listening and I'm looking at her. And I'm like, I'm like Lisa, you know, who, who, who is this? She goes, that's my Angelo, man. She said, my Angelo. I said, wow, she's incredible. And I, I, so I sat there and listening to her. I'm like, man, she's amazing. And while I was sitting there listening to her, and she's a world-class author, right? I, if I could write like her, now I'd be, I'd be proud of myself. I've written six books. I can't touch her. So anyhow, well, the sixth one I just finished over the weekend. So midway through dinner, Dr. Stoneberg goes, and he had this long white beard. He kind of looked like Santa Claus. He had this long white beard. And he was very eccentric, and he kind of talked like this, and he goes, Sean, why don't you tell Miss Angelou your story? I'm like, who, me? You want me to tell my, what? what? He said, about Miss Green. I said, okay, I'll tell the story. So I tell the story about Mama Green, and my Angelou, she sits back in her chair like this, and she looks at me, and she goes, Mr. Schwanner. She goes, that's a fascinating story. You need to write a story about Miss Green. And I look, I'm like, okay. I said, all right, someday I might do it. And so, in 2016, uh, two, yeah, 2016, I was literally in one of the darkest places of my life. And I didn't really know where to turn. Things were imploding. Um, I was having some not, issues as to whether or not I wanted to stay in Miami, to, you know, all kinds of stuff, personal stuff, which. That's a whole other issue. I'll, I'll talk about that in my, my last book, which is Got at First Sight. So I said, well, I'm walking down the busway, and I say to myself, and I remembered one of Mama Green's sayings, and some of you asked about this, if, if Mama Green were in my life, would I be here? And the, the answer is my life would be vastly different. I wouldn't be in class with you, that's for sure. 
And so I'm walking down the busway, and I'm having real challenges. And all I could keep thinking was, she used to tell me every day, Sean, you have a million dollar personality. Never let anyone take that away from you. Nobody. And I'm sitting here saying, okay, never take that away. Never let anyone take your personality away. So I opened up my phone, and I tape recorded the, the quotation. And the next quotation, because somebody asked me, um, what are the three most important lessons that I learned from Mama Green? And you've heard it before. The first one, and this is a social problem, right? Hate is a social problem. Negative judgment, which is called prejudice, discrimination, etc. The, the very first thing that I learned that was most important to me for, uh, who was this? Maria, was never hate, never judge. Never judge someone unless you've walked in another's shoes, and if you haven't walked in their, or, and if you haven't walked in their shoes, they can't be judged. That was the first thing. Second thing is, and this has been a tough one for me, never let a man leave your home hungry, right? Never let a man leave your home hungry, which is not about food, it's about if somebody hungers, or if someone wants something desperately in their life, that they need something. It is your job as a human being to reach your hand out and extend your hand and feed them food. And so, like, it's not just the homeless, it's like if you're, if you're hungry for knowledge, if you're hungry for self-improvement, if you're hungry to make a better life, if you're hungry to get out of your sensu current situation, if you're hungry, you feed somebody. If you, have, if you have food that's sitting on your table, right, and you just happen to have the knowledge or the capability or the networks or whatever to feed somebody, you feed them. And so, like, for example, with my students, I feed you guys all the time. I don't just give you uh, terminology from the book. I try to give you stuff that comes from a real perspective. It's framed from a book. It's framed from concepts. I mean, it's not like I'm talking outside of social problems or sociology or what have you, but not only is it framed, I give it to you because I know you're hungry for something new. I know you're trying to build a career. You're at the beginning point. And based upon the fact that you're hungry to move on and move up, I give you the food that is my knowledge, my experience, so that you can eat and internalize it for yourself, right? So never let a man leave your, leave your home hungry. And the last thing was is you have a million dollar personality. Never let anyone take that away. So, I start tape recording. For those of you who asked me the question, um, why did you write this book? Was it a hard process to write a book? Um, what I did was, and I did the book wrong. I, if I had to do it again, I'd have completely done it in a different way. It would have been basically the same, but I'd have, I'd have came at it differently. So what I did was, is if you go through the book, there's 186, 187 quotations, right? The, the things that I put in bold, like, you know, I'm too old a cat to get scratched in the ass by a kitten. I love that, right? You, you know, um, Irma Jean, Irma Jean, uh, what she used to say? Um, she used to say to me, uh, what did she say? Irma Jean will give a dog's ass a toothache, right? Where did that come from? You know, never trust a snaggletooth bastard. But that one, never trust a snaggletooth bastard. That one, by the way, was one that probably saved me from uh, a grotesque sexual assault um, that... Uh, was thwarted because I was taught if you don't tr you can't trust a snaggle tooth bastard. In other words, you can't trust other people. And she used to say, and your parents probably said the same thing: never open the door for a stranger. But she went a step further and she said, never open the door for a stranger or for anybody you know. The only people you answer the do open the door to is me, Daddy Green, Leo, her son Guy, Irma Jean, and your mother. Those are the only five. Other than that. Nobody comes in your home, and as it turns out, uh, before I was sexually assaulted, um, which was a bizarre situation, um, the person that did that had come to my house about two weeks earlier, and I knew who he was. He was my mother, you know, friend. And so he said, hey, can I come in? I got this game for you. It was a football game where you press the buttons, and the little dot just runs up and down, and you're trying to go up the field. Very simple game. And I wondered if he would bought it for me for Christmas, and then when my mother wouldn't marry him, he slammed it down the railroad tracks and broke it, which broke my little heart. Well, he came back later and said, hey, I bought you one. It wasn't your fault. Can I come in and give it to you? I said, nope. He said, but you know me. I said, yeah, I know you, but you can't come in, right? I said, my mom will be home in about three hours. You can come in then when she's here. And as it turns out, it was a God-saving grace that she had taught me to never trust a snaggletooth bastard. So all these sayings that I had remembered from her, I started lining them up. So when I started writing the book, what I did was, is I would take one of the quotations, then I'd write a story of what it reminded me of. So I'd write a story around the quotation, 
then as I started writing so many stories, 187 quotes in a different story, now they started blending into each other, they started smacking into each other, and then all of a sudden it became an absolute monstrosity and I had to reorganize it. It took me, geez, it took me two months, well, about two weeks to reorganize it. And somebody, I can't remember if it was Cassandra or who it was, somebody asked me how long did it take me to write the book. Well, it's hard to answer because on the one hand, it took me two months total to write the book. It took me about two months to edit it eight times. So it was about four months. But in between time, let me tell you something. Um, <laughs> those of you who have read it, I can tell by, based upon your questions who has read it and how far you read. Okay, because if you're asking me what year did Mama Green die, then you didn't read it to the end, right? Because it was pretty clear as to when she died. But the thing was, is that the pain of reliving, because some of that stuff I didn't relive again, like the sexual assault, I hadn't relived that. It was buried away in some deep place. I put on a uh, virtual mask, just like Irving Goffman talks about. Irving Goffman says that everybody wears a mask. So when you're on your front stage, you have a formal mask. When you're on your backstage, you have an informal mask. Then the other set of masks that you have, you wear your mask according to the na nature of the stage that you're performing on. So every time you play a role, you put on a different mask, right? So what happened was, is once the assault had taken place, I put on a mask, and the mask was um, masked behind uh, humor. I was, a, I was a really funny dude back then. Um, I, yeah, I got my moments now, but I was really funny back when I was younger. I was very athletic, so I hid behind sports, I hid behind humor, and basically I had shut down because I was told I was a liar. Uh, when I reported it to Irma Jr. and my mom, what had happened, they called me a liar. There's no way he would do that to you. And, you know, I'm sitting here saying, I didn't tell Mama Green because if I told Mama Green, she would have shot and killed the guy. So I didn't want him to die. I just wanted them to know not to let him in the house. And they called me a freaking liar. And I was like, oh, my God, are you serious? Because what had happened was when he assaulted me, he'd put hickeys, and, among other things, but he put this red scarf of hickeys all the way around my neck. It's, it was as bright as my hat is, right? And it was all around my neck. And after the attack took place, my mother was in her bedroom at the time, and Irma Jean was on the front porch, and I was in my bedroom. And so I, I thought it was awfully bold for this out, you know, for this drunken man to come in my room. I, you know, I was playing with my baseball cards. What are you doing, Shine? So anything, this thing unfolds, and the dog, my dog Zeus, rips at the door, and the door flies open. It was one of those Venetian doors that opened in the middle. So when Zeus uh, went down the middle of the door, the door flung open, guy jumps off me, he leaves or whatever, and I try to regroup and I look in the, in the mirror. Norma Jean was such a Puritan in terms of sexuality. I mean, I wasn't allowed to talk to girls. I wasn't allowed to, certainly wasn't allowed to kiss them. If I wanted to date one, are you crazy? You know, Matt, no, you're not, no. Because if you date them, they're going to get in your way of accomplishing your dreams. And if they get in the way of accomplishing your dreams, they're going to get pregnant, then you're going to be a teenage father. No, stay away from them. I'm like, geez. But she would say, if you come home gay, I'm going to kill you. So <laughs> essentially, uh, I couldn't date anybody. I had to be completely boxed in. But the reason I tell you that is simply for the fact that when he attacked me, I had all these hickeys around my neck. It looked like a scarf. It looked like a winter scarf being from Toledo. So I said, damn, what am I supposed to do with this? I said, well, let me go to my best friend Booney's house. So I decided I'm going to go to Booney's. Uh, Booney lived about two blocks away over on Oak Street. So I go over to Booney's house, and there's a girl there. Her name was Deanna, um, and Deanna had always had a she had a crush on me, and she used to want me to hold her hand and you know hug her and you know kiss her or whatever. And I was like, no, man. I said, look, I, all I want to do is play second base for the Reds, okay? I don't want to do any of this stuff. So she said, oh, come on, Sean, just just one little. I'm like, no, man, no, I'm good. I'm set. No, I don't want to. Cause I hear Emma Jean talking back here. And I'm not trying to get beat up, and I'm not trying to get in trouble. So I said, no, I can't do that. And she was a delightful person. I mean, she's one of my best friends to this day. So I go to Booney's house, and she's sitting there. And while, while she's sitting there, she's on the porch. And she comes over, and she hugs, jumps. You know how you jump, jump up and you hug somebody? Well, she jumps up, and she hugs me. And I trip on the, the side of the sidewalk because the sidewalk was cracked in the front. And we fall down on the ground, and I'm on my back. And... You know, she's on top of me, and we're wrestling around and stuff. I'm like, you know, hop off. And she's like, no, I want to want to hop off. And I said, come on, hop off. And you know, I just kind of pushed her away a little bit. And when she looked down, she saw my neck. And 
the tears started to roll down her face. Booney's on the porch. He's laughing because he knows what it is, right? It's the hickeys. And she says, I thought, I thought you never wanted to date anybody. And I'm like, I do. I just want to play for the Reds. But, you know, there's a girl at school that, you know, I kind of like her. She likes me. And we kind of got caught up in, you know, some stuff. And, you know, that's actually, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to hurt you. Of course, I'm lying. Then I go to school, and that very girl, she's like, I thought you didn't want to date anymore. I said, well, I want to play second base for the Reds, but there's this girl in the neighborhood, and, you know, we kind of, you know, and this kind of happened. So in this situation, I go tell the truth. What really hurt was when I was walking off the porch to go to Booney's house, um, he's sitting there on the front porch with my mom sitting on his lap, and they're both drinking uh, black velvet and Coke. And, oh, man. So I'm walking out the, uh, off the porch, and so... He looks up from behind my mother, and he smiles, and he has, he goes, he goes, hit a home run, Sean. And Sean's sitting here saying, why don't, why don't I just punch you in the face? How would that be? And so I was angry, and it was just like so freaking humiliating, but I didn't understand why Irma Jean and my mom didn't see it when I walked out. But when I came home, they saw it. Irma Jean saw it. She's a, and she curses at me, and she said, what is that on your neck? I said, nothing. I said, I fell down playing. She said, no, you didn't. I know what that is. And who was it? And I said, nobody. Nobody. And she said, I know what it was. And I said, now I told her. I said, here's what happened. She called me a liar. My mom comes running out because she hears the yelling. And she said, what's going on? And Irma Jean says, look at his freaking neck. And I'm like, um, so-and-so did it. And she's like, you're a liar. I'm like, I'm not lying. Why would I lie about it? No, this is what happened. And when both of the people who were there to protect me called me a liar, that's when the mask came on. So a lot of you students, you know, who, and as a matter of fact, one of you who I, I can't, who won't identify, I just want to say thank you for telling me how, because some of you have asked me, um, have my experience and sharing my experiences helped anybody else along the way? Let me tell you what, man. The only reason I do this, it's not like this is pleasure for me revealing these things that happen. Um, but what happens is, is that when you live behind this mask, uh, Mama Green called it the Temple of Pain. When you live behind the temple of pain, right, and it's based upon real things that have happened, and you hide behind that, that, that mask, because your virtual self is protecting your authentic self, right? So if you're looking at um, Carl Jung, we have an authentic self. Irvin Goffman says we protect our authentic self with a virtual self, with a mask, right? So what happens is you become adept at wearing these masks, you become adept at making sure that um, we hide from other people. So I lived a whole life of hiding. And literally, that, was, uh, that took place in 1978. And in 2016 is when I finally decided that I was going to write this book so I could relieve all the demons from within me. So those of you who asked me, um, how was the process? It took four months because while I was writing it, it became so freaking painful remember this stuff like this thing I hadn't even thought about it in 20 years you know and then all of a sudden here it is in the forefront when daddy green died you know that you know someone in I don't know who it was somebody asked me um were you, were you angry when daddy green died um because those of you who read through the book you will know that daddy green and I were exceptionally close we were we were best friends and every night he would feed me cheese and I would sit on his knees and he would tell me you know, he would tell me these stories about growing up in the South and why he came up North and what it's like to work and what it was like to live through World War II where they gave you rationing cards where you couldn't just buy what you wanted in the store. You had to have a rationing card um, so you could go get food and, you know, all these kind of things, how hard it was to get work, etc. So he would tune me in on stuff and teach me all about the Tigers, Detroit Tigers baseball, and Mama Green would chime in, but she was always, t typically she was cooking. So Daddy Green and I were really close. Mama Green and I were very close, but early on, Daddy Green and I were close. And for those of you who want to know why the cycle of abuse didn't go into my children, why my children, I've never raised my voice at them, they've never been touched, they've definitely never been spanked or anything like that. And the reason is really simple, is because Daddy Green was my mentor as far as being a father. And what I learned from him was, is that you can be gentle, you can be loving and caring, and if you do it in a consistent and respectful way, uh, you don't have to spank a child to get them there. I know, and I know a lot of you want to debate me on that, and, you know, there's a place and a time for it. However, 
what it turned out to be was is that he was teaching me that there are alternative scripts going back to Goffman there are alternative scripts that men and women can read from and I was taught that I didn't have to read from a violent script if I ever had children of my own and so I worked but I was afraid now don't get me wrong I was petrified to have children because um, my house was so explosive and my, just to clarify my mom didn't spank me every day okay my mother did love me my mother was cold but she loved me but she didn't spank me every day but when she did it was explosive and when she did I didn't know if I was gonna live or die it didn't happen all the time but when it did happen as a little boy it was a petrifying experience and then I had these two other women who threatened to kill people in front of me not kill me but kill other people and it's like whoa man these are these are some tough women right so daddy green was this man that said you know there's alternative methods for men to be fully men without having to be violent aggressive and strong in the traditional sense and so I took in these uh, messages I took in these messages so around what was it 1974 um, yeah, it was 1974. It was November, he died on November 2nd, 1994, or 74. And what had happened was he had had a stroke. He went to go get a physical. And when he went to get the physical, um, he was sitting on the, the table at, the, at his doctor's office. And the doctor said, Leo, you're doing great. Um, go ahead and get dressed and we'll check you out or whatever. And so while he was getting dressed, leaving the doctor's office, he literally had a stroke on the table. And they couldn't resuscitate him. He had had a massive stroke right there in the hospital. And that was in October, early October. So um, Mama Green called me. I was playing with the kids in the, in the neighborhood. And Mama Green called my house and she said, Baby, Daddy's had a stroke. And I'm a little, I don't know what that means, right? I know what it means because he had another one. But, I, you know, I don't know what it means. I'm like, oh, my God, is he okay? And she says, I don't know. So what happened was for the next three or four weeks, Mama Green stayed at the hospital constantly. And I was always in the waiting room, and Gloria, who was, Mama Green had a son, his name was Leo, and his wife's name, who was, she was a Caucasian female, her name was Gloria, right? and they had just had a baby, Jason. Jason was way too small, I mean, Jason's deceased now, unfortunately, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, which is sad, but, um, so we would all wait out in the, in the waiting room at St. Luke's Hospital in Toledo. Well, it's actually in Maumee, but we'd wait at St. Luke's Hospital. And Gloria would take me down to get caramels and some candy and chips and stuff like that. And, and I was a little entrepreneur back then, and I'd be drawing these pictures of these stupid horses, and I'd be selling them to people out in the waiting room. I'd say, hey, well, you want to buy this horse? <laughs> They'd give me like a nickel or something like that. I'd say, oh. So next thing you know, I'd say, hey, would you like for me to draw something for you? Yeah. I was horrible draw. I can't draw now, let alone back then. So I draw a little horse's head. They say, oh, that's wonderful. I get a nickel. So I walk home with a little money. But every time Mama Green would come down to give us an update, I'd say, hey, Ma, tell Daddy Green. Tell him I said hi. I want to come see him. And she said, okay, baby. So she would go up there. And then I said, did you tell him I said hi? And she said, yeah, baby. I told him you said hi. Did he say anything? She said, no. And then a couple weeks went by. And she said, He's, every, time she's, um, every time I tell him that you're trying to say hello, he tries to open his eyes. And I'm like, he does? Yeah, she, she, I think he can hear us. I think he can understand us. But I, I know that, um, I think that if you could talk to him or whatever, he, he would come out of it because he's trying. And I said, okay, Ma. So I started begging my mother. I said, Mom, please let me go see Daddy Green. Please let me go see Daddy Green. And, you know, because he's on tubes, he's in intensive care. You know, he's in a place where little kids aren't supposed to be. But I begged her and I begged her and I begged her and I begged her. So finally, on I think it was like Friday, November 1st. Oh, yeah, God, November 1st. That's the date of my life changing event. Uh, that's the day my mom tried to kill me, but that was in 1981, seven years later, November 1st. Anyhow, so Friday, November 1st, the nurses and the doctors give me permission to go upstairs to go see Daddy Green. And so. Here I am, I'm, I'm so excited to go see him. And my mom said, no, 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 we can't, we can't have him go up there right yet. I need to get him a coat. He's got to get a new coat. Um, I'll get him a coat this weekend, and then he can go up there. Uh, I'm like, a new coat? So why don't I have to have a new coat to go see Daddy Green? I said, let me go up there. We, I can save his life, Ma. I can save his life. 
Let me go up there and say hi to him because he'll live. He'll live. I want him to live. No, baby, let me get your coat. You can go up there on Monday. I said, Mom. I said, I said okay, all right, all right, whatever. So the next day, um, November 2nd, my best friend from second grade, his name, well, I had a lot of them, but one of them in particular, his name was Bill Stewart. Bill was the first person that had ever come over to my house. You know, I lived on the east side, the poor end of town, and um, Bill was really close to me, and Jamie and Sexum and a bunch of other people. As a matter of fact, I spoke to Sexum. Uh, he's the vice president of Twitter right now, and we, uh, he, me, and Product Multani. Product is like the head <laughs> cancer researcher at his company, phenomenal guy. And then, of course, uh, my real commercial real estate broker, best friend, Eric, who lives in Denver. So Bill Stewart had come to my house, and I'll never forget it. So I finally had my first friend come to my home. You know, I'm a little nervous because you know I live on the live in a ghetto and stuff, and you know I don't know exactly what the implications are, but I know there's just a difference. And so we're playing in the living room, and I get a call from Mama Green, and Mama Green goes, "Baby," I said, "Yeah, Ma." He, she goes, "Daddy died." I said, "What?" And she goes, "Daddy died. He's not he's not with us anymore." And, and she goes, you're going to have to be the man of my house now. I said, who, me? Uh, I said, what, that, what, Daddy Green died? And I just laid my head on the back of a chair, and, you know, I was mesmerized. I was dumbfounded. I didn't cry. I said, you got to be strong for Mama Green. And Billy, he come up and came up, and he started patting me on the back. And my mom came in. She gave me a great big hug. So my mom was lovable now. Don't get me wrong. She hugs. Baby, you're gonna, it's going to be okay. And so I go back over to her house. Mom Green comes home, and I'm at her house. It's just me and she. And she just breaks down crying. And I'm just like, oh, my God, it's so heavy because here's the strongest woman on the planet saying, you know, um, you know Daddy's dead, and I don't know what I'm going to do without him, and it's going to have to be you because God has moved out. It's just you and me now, baby. It's just you and me. And it was for the next six years. It was just me and Bertha Green on this hill. And so I said, okay, Ma, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you need, whatever you want. But I never had a chance to cry, right? I never had a chance to grieve. So I start writing this book. Oh my God, are you serious? I start writing this book, and just, while I'm writing this chapter, man, the tears are just rolling down my face, and I'm like, I can't. I'm living these sexual assaults again. The, you know, the first time I was sexually assaulted that I remember, I was seven or eight years old. This old lady, and she was an old lady, and she's probably 65, 70 years old, little mustache across her lip. She came up and kissed me on the back of my head when I went to, went to the little convenience store. It wasn't much bigger than my apartment. And so my, I, back in those days, back in the... Look, it's a whole different world, right? You want to talk about social problems. The nature of drugs and alcohol back in those days is a lot different than it is today. My mom had told Gladys, who owned the, the corner uh, convenience store, she said, Gladys, whenever Sean comes in, if he asks for beer or if he asks for cigarettes, just give them to him because it's coming from me. So I can, so I could have anything I wanted, but I didn't do anything, but I could have. So I go in there, and this particular day, they wanted milk. So I go to the milk, and when I go to get the milk, uh, this old lady comes up and kisses me on the back of my head. And I'm looking around, I'm like, what? And I look, and there's this lady, and she's, she said, hi, cutie. I'm like, how you doing, ma'am? Uh, uh, good to see you. I don't know, some, maybe a week later, I don't know. I come in there, and this lady comes zooming up, boom. Kiss me on my cheek. I'm like, oh, God, what is going on here, baby? What is this? Next thing you know, a week later goes by. Here she comes. I don't know where she came from. I never saw her. She comes around the side, plops one right on my lip, slips in her little tongue, and gives me a little French kiss and said, hey, sweetie. I'm like, ah, oh, my God, what is this? Right? So I, got, I ran out of there. I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, Gladys, what is going on with her? And so, so I never see her again, but it was like, it's not, it's not rape, right? But it certainly is, uh, it is called gross sexual imposition, right? Um, you know, uh, well, not harassment of a minor, but it is uh, uh, endangering a minor, right? Because it's malfeasance. But in any case, so, so I'm going through that. I'm going through my dad. Oh, I'm going through Daddy Green dying. And then a few years later, you know, I'm writing about my father's suicide. And, you know, the morning I'm sitting there at the breakfast table and, you know, I'm listening to a radio. And the radio has just a little, um, what do you call it, a coat hanger as, a, as an antenna. And I listen to CKLW, which is from Detroit. I listen to WOHO from Toledo. And I listen to the radio for the news every day because I like to go into class and act like I knew stuff. And, 
when we sit in our big circle in third or fourth grade, uh, Mr. Wicks would say, anyone have any news events? And I'd say, yeah, I do, I do. And I'd recite everything I heard on the radio, and he said, oh, that's interesting news, Sean, thank you very much. And I'd say, yeah, anything, Mr. Wicks. So one particular day, I'm sitting there eating my eggs and Jiffy Corn Muffin Mix and uh, some orange juice and, and some bacon. And, um, <laughs> and it's not funny. I mean, it's funny what I'm eating, but it's not funny what happened. So the radio comes on, and I'm listening to it, and the announcer goes, you know, the police dragged the Maumee River, and they found the body of a person who had jumped off a high-level street bridge to his death a couple nights ago, right? And so I'm like, mm, that's sad, because you hear about it periodically. And my mom said, hey, can I say something, Shawnee? I said, yeah, sure. She turns off the radio, and she goes, um, I don't know how to tell you this. I said, what's that? She goes, that was your dad. I'm like... Who, Bryce? She goes, yeah, it was Bryce. And I said, hmm, I said, he's a nice guy. But I really didn't know him too well. I said, okay, well, all right then. So I'm eating my, you know, I'm eating my eggs and I go on about my business. And it really wasn't until 1996 when I had gone through a very dark period of time in my life that I started seeing, finally realizing the images of my father plummeting from that bridge. And it, as it turns out, it was really a complicated situation because my father talking about social problems, right? I'm coming back to the point, don't worry. I'm, I know I'm way off. It seems like I'm way off. I'm not. So my father had bipolar disorder, and it was so bad that they had to give him electroshock therapy, which now you can't do anymore. And so he was a musician, and one of his best friends was Stevie Wonder. You know, you've heard of Stevie Wonder, the song Superstition. Back in the 60s when my dad would tour up in Toledo with his, uh, it was called the Bryce Cole Symphony Orchestra which was a actually a, a classic rock and roll type band or whatever, but he was the pianist and the lead singer or whatever. And so he was very musical, but he had bipolar disorder and he was an alcoholic. So he was in and out of jail. He was on probation actually when I was born. And he fled. He was an absconder, which I ended up doing research on. He absconded to Florida where he disappeared because when my mother was pregnant with me, his wife was pregnant with my sister, who was about two months older than I am. Um, but I didn't know I had sisters, and I didn't know I had brothers, and all that kind of stuff. I had seven brothers and sisters I never knew of through him, and I've only met two or three of them since once, and haven't talked to any of them. Cindy, I spoke to about three years ago, but other than that, I've only spoken to everybody one time, and that was it, and I met her mother one time. But she kicked him out. She said, you know what, you got someone else trying to get out of here, man. Your, 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 um, your mood swings are just killing this family. We need you to leave. So he absconds down to Florida. My mom told him, no, I don't want you in my life. I'll raise this boy on my own because she had Mama Green. And so when uh, I find out that my stepfather has jumped off, the, my, not my stepfather, when my dad had jumped off the bridge, um, I said, dang, that's messed up. My dad committed suicide, right? And it was about, it was when I was 40. On my 40th birthday, I found a bunch of letters that my dad had written to my mom. And so that was, what, 14 years ago. And one of the letters... Uh, or one of the, there was a newspaper clipping that said um, man jumps to his death off the high level street bridge from 10 feet up with the police in pursuit. The police were in pursuit. So I'm sitting here thinking to myself, if, why would he jump from 10 feet when the highest point on the bridge is 165 feet up? Why didn't he, if he wants to die, why didn't he jump from 165 feet up in the air instead of 10 feet? Right? And then what happened was he jumped over and he hit his head on the foot or the cement support beam or the, the, the cement support at the bottom. He jumped off and he hit his head and it crushed his skull and he went in the river and floated away. So I reflected as a criminologist, I reflected on it. So he had been an absconder. He just came out of the state mental institution, which I had to go in and get him out. And let me tell you something. Back then, it was a different world. I walked in, I'm 10 years old, 11 years old, and I got people like firing umbrellas at me and stuff and talking to themselves up against the wall. I'm just this little kid, and I'm like, what is going on here? And I get to the nurse's station, I say, I'm here to pick up my dad, Bryce Cole, and she said, he's in there, and he turns because he had electroshock therapy, so he had no control, and he turns real slow and says, hey, Sean. I'm like, uh, come on, Bryce, let's go. So we took him to Woody Garfield's house, and Woody Garfield was a direct descendant of President Garfield, he was his grandson. He had fought in World War II, and in World War II, he had actually been captured by Nazi Germany, and he was in Stalag 13, which was famous for Hogan's Heroes, a TV show back in the 70s. And he had emaciated down to 70 pounds when, I don't know how he did it, 
but he escaped underneath the fence um, to escape from Nazi Germany. And he got away, and he ended up getting a purple, purple heart. And the reason I know it is because I saw it. And he starts telling stories, and the stories were just unbelievable. He lived in the ghetto of the ghetto, but it was a fantastic. And then he fell in love with my mom, complicates things with my dad. Everything's getting crazy. And my dad, when he was relieved from the state institution, had to go stay with Woody. And I think what happened was, as he was walking over the high-level street bridge from Woody's going to downtown, and I think the police started chasing him. He wanted to avoid capture, so I think he jumped off the bridge. And, you know, I'm not going to say that they threw him off, but I'm definitely going to say he was trying not to be captured because he didn't want to go back to the state institution. So for 28 years, I'm sitting here thinking that my father had killed himself, and then I read this newspaper article, I said, there's no way he killed himself. It had to be an accidental death. But in my head, it was lodged in, right? Suicide. And so I'm sitting here saying to myself, man, that's crazy. That's crazy. But back to the question. It took me four months to write it. Because when I came across situations, you know, I had never been, like, emotionally disturbed by my, my dad's death. I was never emotionally disturbed by Daddy Green's death. You know, I handled Mama Green's death in stride. It never, it never bothered me. And then the very end of the book, you read the last, you read, read the last three pages. And if you're not crying, you call me and say, man, you couldn't make me cry. Men and women, I'll tell you what, I cry when I read it now. So, when I wrote the book, it was really hard to write. Somebody in here, I don't know who it was, asked me the question, was it therapeutic to write Dear Mama? Because a lot of people say, you know, you get the demons out, you get all the stories out of your system, and now it's, no, man, not for me. Let me tell you something. Putting that stuff out there, one, was exceptionally hard, right? Because now there are no secrets. I can't go hiding. Uh, there's nothing I can do. People can either judge me and they don't. They don't. They don't. Most people have been inspired by the stories because they say, dang, if Sean can do it, I can do it. And so based upon those kind of things, it was worth writing for that purpose. But to make me feel better, no. No. It, it was, uh, it was, it was, because I had to relive it all again. Um, like when my mother tried to kill me, that was, that was very difficult, very difficult to write that section. Um, because it brought up the most traumatic memories of my life. That was, you know, November 1st, 1981 was the day that changed my life forever. I mean, other things had happened along the way, but it was the morning child that died that, you know, my, my whole existence was transformed in a moment. I went from being a pretty, I was always a nice kid, I'm a nice kid now, but uh, when I got attacked in my sleep at 5.32 in the morning, and, you know, I feel this, lamp crashing down over my head and it's shattered all over the room and you know I'm getting pummeled because I can't move my arms because they're under this blanket and she's straddling the blanket you know that's where my PTSD came in so now I got PTSD um, and it makes it really hard it makes it really hard to trust people right it makes it really hard to trust people that are supposed to love you so what happened for me was I already had the mask on from the sexual assault now I got another mask on which would not permit me to become very close to people now i'll be very close to you if you you know if we're having a conversation and you have worry and a concern and you need to tell me something it's safe here I, i'm never going to tell anybody that's just the way it is this is like a mafia approach what comes in here stays in here because i'm not trying to die because you told me information right but um if you're trying to be in a relationship with me it's a different situation because what i'm going to do is i'm putting the wall up immediately because i can never trust the people that were closest to me i can trust my mama green but i couldn't trust my mom I ended up trusting her later. We became best friends later. But, you know, I'm sitting there conjuring up and remembering laying on that freaking floor in my own blood trying to decide if my life is worth having or not worth having, whether or not um, I should extract revenge, should I run away? What, 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 what should I do in this particular situation, right? And, of course, I called Mama Green and she bails me out or whatever. And that was a, a, a saving grace having her pick me up. But, again... You know, she's putting the gun to my mother's face, and, or to her head, not to the temple. And she said, if you ever touch him again, I will kill you. I will shoot you dead. And, you know, it's, it's, it's scary to watch that. And we left the house, and I went with Mama Green. And immediately, the rebuilding began. But it, it began from a damaged state. So, you know, someone asked me what was a long-term impact. Long-term impact was, it was twofold. One, I became a much more compassionate human being. Right, much more empathetic. I became much more uh, distant. Right, 
especially from emotions. So I'm already an Aquarius. So you throw an Aquarius in there with some PTSD, with some attacks from nowhere. Next thing you know, you know you got this guy who can turn off and on just like a light switch. If I, you know, if I get angry, boom, it's done. The light switch is off, and I have to sit down and really gain control because all the scripts that I was taught were violent scripts. If somebody aggrieves you, your job is to extract revenge. Mama Green used to tell me, never ever start a fight, but make sure you're the one that ends the fight, right? So all of a sudden, if someone starts with me, now all of a sudden, here it comes. So I had to really sit back and learn the language of how to manage anger. And so the anger really came from, you know, I never once got in trouble. I was never in contact with the police. I never smoked dope, never did drugs, never drank unless I was at home. That was a different situation. Never stole anything. I never did anything wrong. I wasn't sleeping with the girls or the boys. I wasn't sleeping with anybody. I was just playing baseball and coming home. Baseball, going home, going to school. That's it. But yet and still, I'm living this life of terror. And for me, it created a lot of cognitive dissonance where I feel like I'm doing good, trying to make you proud. But over here, you're never proud and you're never fully happy. And that constant battle in my head became a, a wall for me. Right? So... In relationships as I got older, I have Irma Jean and her puritanical thinking. I got the neighborhood and teenage pregnancy. Then I got this constant push and pull on who do you trust, who do you not trust, how much do you express. So I became a master of illusions, which is I tell you all this stuff up here. What I'm doing back here, where is it? What I'm doing back here is completely different. It's just a magician doing his little show. And here you're seeing this. You see this? I tell you everything about my life up front, but you don't know anything about going on back here. So I became this master of this. And writing this book, it was the most difficult experience of my life because I had to relive it all. And I decided to do it for the fact that um, I thought I would make other people's lives better. Because at the end of the day, the thing that I always realized is, is I made it out of there, right? I became a great dad. Uh, you know, my kids are terrific. And I've been very good to my students. You know, you can go look up you know, I've been at two institutions now since 2007, neither of which give out a teaching award, right? So, in from 1988 through 2004, what's that, 6 to 14 years? Well, do the match on. 88 to 2004 is 16 years. So, in 16 years, I received t seven teaching awards, right? I was a top teacher three times. I received four other awards. I was a national runner-up at McDonald's for the uh, National Diversity Teacher of the Year Award and had a numerous, numerous uh, nominations where I came runner-up for awards I wasn't even eligible for. Like I was eligible, I, was, I wasn't runner-up, but I was nominated for Professor of the Year at Ohio State even though I was only a teaching assistant, which rarely happens. When I was at um, University of Louisville, I was untenured, and when I was untenured, I was uh, runner-up for a distinguished, distinguished uh, professor and also for the Trustees Award, which I wasn't even eligible for, but things happen and I was the runner-up and so I was really good at what I was doing and then for the next I don't know 13 years I teach at institutions where you know they don't give out teaching awards so you know who knows what would have happened but what the important part is is that what I've been able to do and I, I wasn't going to become a teacher someone asked that question uh, how'd you become a teacher why'd you become a teacher and why'd you how'd you end up in Miami I didn't become a teacher because I wanted to teach you guys I had a full-time job offer to go work for the Philadelphia 76ers in public relations because I worked with the Sixers in 87 during Julius Irving's retirement season and I, they had offered me an entry-level position if I wanted it when I came back in the fall of 88 and so that's what I wanted to do because I knew that because of my abilities, right, I'm a pretty smart guy at times and because I knew sport, you can't tell, but I knew sports inside, I was cold man, when it came to sports, especially the coaching end of it, forget about it genius when it comes to that. You think I know criminology and sociology? Forget about that. Sports. Boy, that stuff just clicks in here, man. It's a, it's a whole nother level. But in any case, so at the end of my spring, spring semester, my senior year in Denison, we have a guest speaker come into our introduction to sociology class. Her name is Sean McEntee. And she talks. Now, I'm already a teaching assistant at Denison. I was, when I was a, a senior in college, I was already, you know, an assistant. And I was lecturing in all the classes, so I was already getting experience teaching and grading and everything that you do. And so she comes in and she's talking about the virtues of Ohio State, 
full ride scholarship and they pay you $730 a month to get your degree. And I said, I get paid $730 a month because I'm only making $150 a month now. I said, dang, I can, $600 more, I can do that. I said, I'd love to teach, but I don't know. I don't think I'm smart enough to teach at the college level. I certainly can't teach people who are my age because I was only 21, you know. Um, and I was like, nah, forget it. And Tabacolian, Bob from Tabacolian, who was the teacher of the class I was assistant in, he goes, what do you think, Sean? I said, ah, that's not for me, man. I said, you know, I want to go work for the Sixers. I, I, I'm not interested. He said, why not? I said, well, one, I said, he said, high school or college? I said, neither one. I said, definitely not high school. Too much energy for me. I said, but college, if I was going to teach, I'd teach college level. He said, well, why, why don't you? I said, one, I can't teach people my age. I said, how, how am I going to get the respect from people my age to teach them? And secondly, I said, I'm not smart enough to teach. I said, I'm not smart enough. He said, he said, GD, Sean. He said, it's not just the concepts that make people a great teacher. I said, what are you talking about? He said, there's nobody I've ever met, all the TAs I've had in 25 years, who are more comfortable with themselves and can insert themselves into a teaching scenario. I said, what? He said, your stories will bring students and they will gravitate to you and the concepts that you bring in about like institutions and just masks and scripts and you know, symbolic interaction, which we've talked about all that today, right? Your ability to blend all that together with real life scenarios, not only will you be a great teacher, you will change lives along the way, right? So, how did I get into it? It was an accident. I didn't become a professor. It was never a goal of mine. And I was like, you, I didn't like doing homework. I did it. I didn't like doing homework. I hated the library, but I went every day. Why? Because I had to get out of the ghetto. I knew that the best way for me to get out of there, not to have to be in a place where I was going to be desecrated, where I was going to be denigrated, where I was going to be insulted every single day because of my masculinity and all these kind of things. I said, the only way out of there is to move out through this way. So I went to school and I did the best I could do. I had grown up surrounded by brilliant people, the most brilliant on the planet. But I didn't feel like I was one of them. So I went to college, or I went to grad school, completely accidental. And how did I end up in Miami? That old saying, you have a million dollar personality, never let anyone take it away. And my last employer up in Kentucky, um, I had a guy, he was a great guy, great guy, we were friends, but I do things a little differently, you know what I'm saying, I don't follow any rules because if I followed rules, I never would have got out of Toledo. And so I had to always adapt doing things differently than others because Mama Green always said, believe in yourself, boy. If you can see it, you can believe it, you can achieve it. And you don't have to play by the rules of everybody else. And Len Jordan used to tell me, that was my advisor at um, Denison, he used to say, your job is not to sing the song that everyone else tells you to sing. Your job is to sing the song that you were meant to sing. And so I said, okay, I'll do things my way. Now it's worked out. I'm kind of a pain for supervisors, but he kept telling me, you know, a cat has nine lives. You've used two. I said, okay. Then he started saying, a cat has nine lives, but you've used eight. And uh, I won't get into this story because it's not pertinent to dear mama, but an incident happened um, related to my position. I was a director of international studies. And, well, actually, I was, I was talking to a friend saying, you know, I should have a raise because I'm doing five jobs. I'm teaching 36 classes a year. I'm the director of this uh, program. I'm doing job placement. I'm doing housing. I'm teaching their classes. I'm picking them up at the airport every time an international student comes in. I'm picking them up. I'm finding their homes. I'm doing everything. I'm doing five people's jobs for, you know, $92,000 a year. And I said, you know, I, I deserve one hundred and fifty. dollars Someone told him what I said. And he turned around and said, hey, I'll give you a choice. You want to be a teacher or a director because you can't be both. So, all right. So that night, I took a $32,000 pay cut with two children, a wife who wasn't working, and a house that was overpriced. And so I said, okay. He thinks he's going to steal my personality. I said, I'm not afraid of you. That night I went home and found a job offering at Miami Dade College. I applied to it. Three months later I had the job offer. And my buddy who created the Culinary Institute downtown at Wilson Campus was already here. And he said, if you ever get a chance to teach criminal justice at Miami Dade, you come down. Why? Because they're going to treat you with respect here. So you don't have to worry about that. I said, okay, cool. Got the job offer. I was gone. It was as simple as that. So Mama Green gave me the strength to do things that other people might not do. Here's this woman. She grows up in an abusive home, terribly abusive home. And 
hers. And, and some of you ask, well, why didn't she run away? Because Bertha was a protector. And her little brother and her little sister were too small to be protected from Dank. So she absorbed all of Dank's venom to protect her sister, her mother, and her brother. Even though she might be 10, 11, 12 years old. So she wasn't going to run away. And what happened was she should have been broken. And in some ways she was. I mean, he stole from her the purity of her nature because she was one of the kindest hearted people. Never let a man leave your home hungry. Are you serious? She used to go down to the railroad tracks, bring people up and feed the homeless at her house and say, okay, you got to go. And we would sit there and we'd have dinner with the homeless and feed them and, you know, she'd give them a drink or whatever and they'd go off on about their business and they protected the outer perimeter of her house. I mean, you know, there's a lot of underground type of stuff taking place, but she never turned her back. She was always caring. She raised Jerry, who was another person that was kind of displaced by his mother, um, Leo's best friend. And so she was always of that kind, kind heart. But he made her so mean and so stern that you couldn't cross her. You better never cross her because she was going to come after you. And she wasn't the one to play those kind of disrespectful games. You can't play those eighth, ninth, ninth grade games with her because she will stop you. And so she had this incredible strength over here. But over here, she had this incredible warmth. So, for me personally, she gave me she gave me all the warmth. Now, there are other people who are jealous because she gave them the strength. But she gave me the warmth. But with her warmth, she gave me strength. Right? I never had to worry. I never had to worry about somebody hurting me. Although I got hurt all the time, they weren't going to hurt me in front of her because the family that still exists, there's not, you know, they they have told me, they have told me on several occasions that their Christmas parties, their, gosh, their um, Thanksgiving dinners, they always talked about when was Bertha going to go to prison for killing my mother. And they didn't understand what the dynamics were because she was like, I, you know, this woman is going to kill Sean one day. And she wouldn't, and her brother R.L. had one of the Thanksgivings or Christmas dinners said why can't she keep her hands off that little boy? Why can't she keep her hands off? Bertha's gonna kill her and so You know I grew up Not feeling like she cared my mom that is but I knew she did but she had to learn through Bertha how to do it and so Without Mama Green, I certainly wouldn't be here not in this chair not, not talking to you. It would have been impossible. Um, as a matter of fact, some of you did ask the question. I don't know exactly where it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible question, and it's really pertinent to social problems. All right? The question is, where would you be if Mama Green had never been in your life? Right? So what, it's a hypothetical question, right? because she was in my life, and this is where I ended up. Then I want to come back to the very first question I received because it's the one that fascinates me the most. Well, where would I be? Right? I, I ask you all when, when I have students who are in a live class, I say, okay, had Martin Luther King been born five years earlier, five months earlier, five days earlier, even five minutes earlier or later, whatever, would he become Martin Luther King? Right? That's a great question. It's a philosophical question. Would he become who he is? Would his natural proclivities and tendencies have taken him to a special place or would every single minutia of interactions have taken in a different way did every single possible thing as it happened bring him to become famous like he became or would he be different I personally feel like had he been born five months earlier or five weeks earlier or five days earlier definitely five years earlier he wouldn't have been the Martin Luther King that we know he probably been great at what he did because of his capabilities and his temperaments, but everything kind of unfolded as it did because of the situations that presented themselves throughout his life. Right? I kind of think that he was what Oprah would say is a you know a success story because it's when opportunity meets preparation. He was always prepared. He's a brilliant man, but we don't know what the opportunities were all along the way. We don't know what what meeting because. He didn't just become the speaker. He was chosen to lead the, the movement because uh, the, the movement knew this bright young speaker at Ebenezer by nature, right? But he was the right personality type 
to lead that particular movement at that particular time. So, if Mama Green were here, there's about three outcomes that could have happened. One, she always told me that when I was little, my mother probably would have killed me. She probably would have shaken me to death because her, her stress and temper were so strong. Um, not that she didn't love me, because she did, but there would have been an emotional outbreak either because of alcohol or because of anger or because of financial stress. She said I would have died. All right, so whoever asked that question, I probably wouldn't be here. But if I did survive it, because I was a very, man, I was a very nice little boy. Oh, my God. If you go, go read the um, Amazon, go read the Amazon reviews, and you'll see that my baseball coach, Jim Wallace, did he even call himself Jim Wallace? Go read what he said. He said, Sean was the most well-mannered young man I've ever met, right? Because I was, I'm, because I didn't want to get beaten down. So I always made sure that I did whatever I could do to make sure my mom was proud. So one, I don't think I'd have made it. Two, I know I wouldn't have been born because she didn't want to have me. She wasn't prepared. So Mama Green stepped in, and that's the reason I was born is because of that. But had I been born, I'd have been adopted out, right? So I'd have had uh, step parents or a foster parent or what do you call them? Adoptive parents. So I'd have had adoptive parents, and who knows what would have happened then? Who knows where I'd have lived? Because if I'd gone to a different school, things would have been different. If I lived in a different neighborhood, a different house, whatever, things would be different. But let's say, for example, that everything would have been fine and I, my mom kept me. Well, my mother wasn't trying to buy a house. Irma Jean convinced my mother, you need to get a house for your son. Because she lived, you talk about the ghetto, man. She lived in the ghetto, ghetto, ghetto when I was born. Mama Green got her to the apartment. And it was only temporary, so she didn't have to live... They, did, they didn't want my mom to live in the pizza parlor. My mother was living in the basement of a pizza parlor in the storage room when I was conceived. And she had been there for like a year and a half or two because it was directly across the street at Gino's Pizza, for those of you from Toledo, right across the street from former Mommy Valley Hospital, which became MCO. So she was living in the basement, and Mama Green and Daddy Green were like, you can't, you can't have a baby living in the basement of a pizza parlor. You've got, you got to have a home. So they got her an apartment over on the West End in a really good and after three weeks and one day, and that's the big statement, um, when she was able to go back to work, that is when I started living with Mama Green. I was three weeks and one day old. And I learned about race, definitely learned about social inequality, you know, racial inequality, economic inequality, unemployment inequality, the value of education. So I was learning about the value of institutions by living them. I learned about hate by watching it. I, you know, it's really hard when you're a little white boy and then you want to go in Pizza Hut and sit down, but Irma Jean won't go in because she doesn't want to be stared at because she's black. Or you go into the grocery store and everyone's saying, you know, they, they start staring at you and they're looking at you and they're laughing or they're saying things and they're saying negative things. They're calling Irma Jean and Mama Green names. They're calling me names. I go to the playground. They call me names. I put them in check. I was a little boy and I put them all in check and they're like, that little kid is clever. You know, it was scary, you know, because they were calling me a very particular n lace name and... I fired back at him, I said, you know, if, you know, if that's what you're calling me, and, you know, you're calling me a lover and everything like that, and I said, I love you, what, what does that make you? I said, the very thing that you're accusing me of being, or what? I said, does that mean I shouldn't like you? And they just stood there and looked at me, and they stared at me, and they're like, okay, all right, what, I can't deal with this kid, which was great, and, you know, I always thought I was... You know, just like everybody else. And when I ran into the guys in 2017, they were like, Sean, now you were never like us. You had something that we didn't have. And that was, you just had this mind, and we knew you were going to be a doctor someday. And I said, I didn't feel that way. They said, yeah, but we saw it. So your question is, would I have been me? Um, I had intelligence, but we don't know if it would have been realized. Because there's a lot of people in my neighborhood that were highly intelligent and still are. But ended up being, you know, white collar or uh, blue collar workers, uh, industrial workers, what have you, which is fine, great income, right? Plumbers and stuff like that. A lot of them went to prison, who were very smart, but went to prison for uh, various factors. So I could have very easily gone down the crime road. I could have definitely been violent, because given what I had seen, um, with a few more muscles, the meanness would have been there. But my school and Mama Green, and I'm Regina, my mom, they gave me that language system. You know, they gave me that professional language system that buffered me from the street language. Because I, you know, I understand all the slang that you're going to throw at me. 
I used to be able to speak slang. I can't anymore because I'm old and I'm not in that world. But when I was, you better believe I could speak it. I definitely could understand it. I still can understand it. But I was professionalized. And that professionalization is what opened the door into this academic world that I live now. I got that offer to write that grant, not because um, I'm inherently smart about understanding violent crime in Florida City. It's because I lived it, I understand it, I got the concepts for it, and I can uh, express it, right? So that combination is what got me out. And then what got me up was Mama Green always taught me how to uh, persevere, be persistent, and be patient. And that's that stupid ball in the wall game, man. Standing there for three or four hours a day, throwing a ball off the wall until I could field it a hundred times and throw it to first base. And if I missed one, I had to go and start all over again. So I had to get a hundred in a row, throw it over, and then I had to throw a stone up and hit it with a broomstick. I had to do it ten times until it went out in the field. And if it didn't go in the field, I had to do it again until I could do Man, that might take eight, ten hours a day. So you had this little kid playing this stupid game by himself until he could do both tasks. And it wasn't that it taught, I, became, I, I had great eye-hand coordination as a kid. My eye-hand coordination, you ask the guys from the east side, they knew I had eye-hand coordination. I could shoot the ball, I could throw, I could, that was great. My coordination was fantastic. I wasn't big, so I couldn't hit for power, but I could hit for average. So I had all that, but what it taught me wasn't what was important as far as becoming an athlete. I could have been a GM for the Sixers. That would have been no problem because my brain worked that way. But what it did give me was the discipline, the drive, the ambition to be uh, ceaseless in my pursuits of greatness. And even though I didn't become a professional baseball because, a player because of the horrible accident that happened to my knee playing baseball, um, because of that, I had learned the skills of what it would take to become a PhD. I don't have a PhD and four master's degree because I'm smart. I have a PhD and four master's degrees simply because of the fact I can sit down for hours and hours and hours without looking up, without eating, without drinking water. That's how I wrote that book last week. Who sits down and writes 75 pages in three days from the top of their head? There's someone who can sit there and just sit there and write and think and stay focused, right? That game of ball on the wall is what kept me focused. And so when I'm dedicated to something, oh my God, I already know I'm unstoppable, right? But that's not because of me, it's because of she, right? So, would I be who I am today? There's no way. Uh -huh. I wouldn't have had to drive. I'm very lazy by nature. I prefer, when we get off of here, I'm probably going to chill. And No, I'm not going to chill. Actually, I have some things to do. I'm going to be working on my uh, part-time financial services job after this. I'm going to call some of the people I'm working with. But, aside from that, and that, too, is because of her. She taught me all the adages and the ethics about saving money, right? She always told me, if you have a penny, you'll never be broke, right? Here's one I love. Here's one that she taught me. If you don't know the value of a penny, you never know the value of a dollar. If you don't know the value of a prayer, you can never know the value of a miracle. Right? So, she used to give me all these adages and money and things like that. And I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't be what I am. I certainly wouldn't have been a sociologist had I not been trained by the ultimate sociologist in a very sociologically useful neighborhood family context that really drove me. Now, here's the question I really want. Oh my God, we're still going. Sorry, everybody. Here's the question that I really like. Why start with a flashback story in chapter one? All right. You know the story starts with, for those of you who read it, with Mama Green shooting her stepfather three times in the back, right? And she goes, I'm going to kill all you motherfuckers. She could, man, she could curse like no one you've ever met. I'm going to kill all you motherfuckers. And he falls onto the, into the driveway and he's rolling around in the dirt. And all the dirt is in the three bullets that she put in his back. And she stands up on the front of the porch and she says, I'll kill you all. And she drops the gun down on the porch. She's emptied the bullets out. Her brother's running this way. Her mom's running through the cotton field with her little sister Pauline. And your question is, why start it there? Because that's the moment that saved my life. Right? Let's look at it. If we look at it from a phenomenological perspective, that is, we are the outcome of all the phenomenon that happened to us. It's not the phenomenon that just happened to us, it's the phenomenon that, that happened to the people that brought us into this world and socialized us to become a part of the system and the structure and the culture that we belong. So the phenomenology, the phenomenon, 
socialize us to participate in the local cultural norms, right? And it's multi-generational, so it gets passed on from generation to generation to generation. So here's the story that saved my life, okay? When Mama Green was about 15, 16 years old, um, her stepfather had been telling people in the casinos and the speakeasies, because it was a wild, wild west in Blyville, Arkansas back 1920s, you know, during the Roaring Twenties, but the Roaring Twenties never meant, this, meant, meant that area, but there was all kinds of legal gambling because it was right on the route from Memphis up to St. Louis. So they had all this, her father was a drunk, and he was a gambler, and he would shoot at people, and he shot two people and killed them, and I mean, all kinds of stuff. So he'd come home, and he'd beat her, and then he'd be drunk, and all kinds of stuff would take place, but she would watch where he hid his money, all right? So she would steal the money, go to the grocery store, and buy cheese, and things like crackers and she and her brother would hide the cheese and the crackers in the hay out in the barn so that they could eat so they could have food and so she would go to the grocery store but the the owner of the store was in the casino when or the speakeasy when her stepfather had said that he someday is going to have to put that stupid little mm, in her place even if he might have to kill her and so the store owner he loved Mama Green. He loved that light that she had, that kindness, that gentle personality, that soul that she had. So when it was getting really bad in the household, he knew it because the stepfather was telling everybody about it. So what he did was, he said, Bertha, here's a gun. Oh, and I don't know his name, but Mr. Anonymous is why I call him that. So Mr. Anonymous gives her a gun. And he goes, if you ever need to use this gun, use it. Defend yourself. And so she hid it in her bedroom. And one day she's baking a pie in the kitchen. And they didn't have windows back then. Uh, they had windows, they didn't have screens. So a chicken flies in through the window and it lands on the pie crust. And it starts pecking around the pie crust. And Bertha was big and strong. She takes the chicken. She's already bare knuckle boxing with her father, right? Knock down, drag out fights. She throws the chicken out the window. It snaps its leg. It breaks its leg. And it's doing a little circle, right? In the driveway. And Mr. Dank comes home. Bertha, what happened to that chicken's leg? What chicken are you talking about? I don't know anything about a chicken's leg. Bertha, what happened to that chicken's leg out there? I don't know. What, what, what are you talking about? Bertha, who broke that chicken's leg? I don't know what chicken you're talking about. I know you broke that chicken's leg. She turned around and said, Am I ever? If you said I broke that chicken's leg, then I broke the chicken's leg. So he pulls out his switchblade, and he flips it out. And he comes at her, he's ready to cut her across the throat. She picks up a cane bottom chair, boom, hits him across the head. The chair shatters a cane bottom chair, which is part of the story. Evidently a very valuable chair today as an antique collector. Shatters the chair over his head. He falls to the ground. The knife goes flying across the kitchen floor. She jumps over him to run into the bedroom to go get the gun. He swipes at her feet and he misses. Pauline, not Pauline, Mama Lad, Mama, Mama Green's mother, and Arrell, her brother, see the commotion. Now they're scared and they're in panic. She goes into the bedroom. And when she goes into the bedroom, she grabs a gun from between her mattress and the bed spring. He walks in. And she fires over his head. Boom! Just like that. Then he said, Oh, she's going crazy. Bertha's going crazy. Fires another one. Deliberately missing. Boom! Everyone scatters out the door. And as he's hitting the door, she's standing in the bedroom. Boom! 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 Three times. Right in the back. Down he goes. The store owner from around the block hears the commotion, hears the gunshots. He comes driving up. Come on, Bertha, we gotta go. He smuggles her out of there. Old man Dang did not die. He did not die. He survived the three gunshots. But Bertha got away. And you see, if Bertha doesn't shoot her stepfather that day, and she dies, when my mother's pregnant some, what would that be, 40 years later, 40 five years later, 
no, it's not that. Forty years later. When my mother's pregnant forty years later, there is no birth of green to intercede on my mother's decision. If Bertha Green doesn't shoot her stepfather back in 1920, 1921, Sean Schwanner is not here. So why do I start the book there? Because that book, that story, is the proverbial, if a butterfly flaps its wings, I don't know, in California, it will create a tsunami in Japan. Because the accumulation of events will transform the world in which you live. For me, I've had 20,000 students now in my career, 18 to 20,000, somewhere in that range. I've taught almost 500 classes, right? 500 sections of classes, um, 65 different types of courses. And just think, she doesn't shoot her stepfather. There's 18,000 students who've never been introduced to me. There are people who are part, who are in domestic violence, dating relationships, or marriages that don't get out. There's 10 students, maybe more, who want to commit suicide, but don't because they've had me as a teacher. That's 10 lives directly, right? There are people who are looking for jobs. There are people who, you know, have gone homeless. There's people who have all these situations that have happened. There are people who have given up on their college dream, but they take my class, and all of a sudden they say, you know, I can do something different. Mama Green doesn't shoot her stepfather. I'm not here. I'm not here, my impact on Japan by flapping my wings no longer takes place. So when I take a look at this particular story, this story, yeah, it's more than a million, right? People write these kind of books all the time. But the reason why I think it's so important is because I have this adage, there's always hope in the darkest place, right? So I have this tour that I'm trying to initiate called Hope From a, hope from a Place of Darkness. My mother came from a place that was dark. Bertha came from a place that was dark. I lived in darkness off and on. But it was from coming from that darkness that I learned how to shine the light that lives within me. Now, I deal with my own dark, right? Because how could I not? I mean, I saw some crazy things. I experienced crazy things. And, but inside of me was this little boy who was taught every single day to believe in yourself, you have a million dollar personality, never let anyone take it away from you. And with those two things alone, it always gave me the strength and the courage to confront danger, questions, change. So when I take a look at what's in front of me, I'm very fearless. I'm not afraid of anything. Right? I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of, I don't want to get tortured, but you know, I don't like pain per se. I'm not afraid of death, I'm not afraid of change, I'm not afraid to uh, confront situations because at the end of the day, there's nothing that you can do to me that would be worse than what I saw coming up. Nothing. There's no way. So, given the fact that I was a powerless child in a powerless situation and overcame that, believe me, I can overcome anything. And so, when I tell my story, right? Because that chicken in the pie crust story, when I tell that, and then you get to understand who I am because of that story, and my own story, with her strength and her adages of wisdom, it allows people to know that you can overcome anything, baby. There's not much that you can't overcome. You might need the support, emotional, physical, um, financial, whatever that may be. You might need that support. It's very hard to do it on your own. I know I could not have done it on my own. I couldn't have done it without the boys at the playground. The very same ones who beat me up were the ones that held me up. I couldn't have done it without Bertha. I couldn't have done it with all those, without all those teachers in school. I couldn't have done it without my mom. I couldn't have done it without Irma Jean. I couldn't have done it without the Bainings, without the Rees, without the Katzners, without the Stewarts, without the Hayjays. I couldn't have done it without all these families. It's as if here's one little boy who's afraid of the world that's in front of them. And all these people that don't even know each other radiate to this little glow that emanates from this little boy's little heart. And they raise them up. And they protect them. And all the messages get reinforced. So when I look at the impact that I can have, it's not because of anything inherent in me. It is a little bit. But it is this, this, this um, overlap between personal ability, 
with a massive network of people who held me up during the darkest day. So here's what I know. The reason I wrote the book was this. Because Sexum asked me, he said, if you're going to be a motivational speaker, shouldn't you be writing something lighter? I said, yeah, I, I am. I'm moving that direction. I said, but Sexum, people have to understand that even in the darkest, even in the darkest night, a star can't shine without the dark, right? And I said, so for me personally, I'm able to take this darkness and understand that not only do I have the light to shine upon others, others have shined the light upon me. And that adage from uh, Coach Carter, where he says it is not our strength that fears us the most, it is our light, because in shining our light, it gives other people by our, simply by our existence the right to live their lives as they want. And so, when I look at the things I've gone through, I still deal with them. Trust me, man, I deal with stuff, okay? I have them very much in control. I know how to manage it all. I, I can manage when I get upset. I can manage it when I feel down. I can manage it when I go through those semicolon type of periods. I can manage it and see it coming. And when I see it coming, I can rewrite the scripts. But the reason I shared the book wasn't for me. Semicolon wasn't for me. A Mother Cries wasn't for me. Lethal violence in the stream wasn't for me. It's for you. And it was so that you know no matter how dark your day gets, there's a possibility of light to shine in at any time. And if you are willing to look at it and extend your hand for help, it's not a weakness. It's a desire and a conviction that you're worthy of something great. I don't care if you're rolling around in the mud. You have greatness in you. Les Brown is absolutely correct. You have greatness in you, and it is just waiting to come to life. You just got to build your team. So the reason I always talk about the team is because I had a team. And the captain, maybe the general manager of the team, was Bertha Green. But I had all these other teammates, right? And for you, in your life, I'm just a teammate, huh? But I am on the team. So those of you who need a teammate, you have a teammate who has been through the rain, who's been through the storm. And I believe that Mama Green's storm... My mother's storm, my grandmother's storm, Herma's guys, Daddy Green's, all of their storms converged in a place where when the storm passed, the sun came out, right? And they radiated their light upon me. And I radiate light upon you and my children. And I try to be a decent person when I come in contact with others. So back to the question. If it wasn't for her, would I have been myself? Would I? Would my life have been different? Yeah, it would have been. I mean, there's no way. Maybe my personality would have shined through psychologically, psychologists say if I would have come out anyhow. I'm not so sure. Maybe. But I know things happen exactly as they did, in the exact way that they did, so that I could be a better human being and be a better teacher. So therefore, there you go. Now I got all these questions here. I only answered like five. If you have any questions, I see that the freaking chat wasn't working. If you have any questions about anything that I asked, um, and I didn't check text messages over the weekend, so I'm sorry because I had to finish that project, send them to me. Sean.HopeWorks at um, gmail.com. Join me on Facebook. Feel free to friend me on Facebook. Feel free to friend me as HopeWarrior1 on Instagram. Subscribe. Share these stories with people. Take, take these videos and share them. Let, let, people, let people go ahead and be lifted outside of you. I love that. But for now, um, I will say I'm going to kick off. Next week's video is going to be really important because next week's is specifically designed to give to you a gift of um, how to be financially free. Right? I'm going to use a social problems perspective to help you gain financial freedom and I'm going to make a supplemental um, supplemental video that you can always use as you get more mature financially that is as you get more mature financially how to manage your money why to manage the money and here's the way to become a millionaire because it is not hard to do but there has to be a strategy in place well everyone sorry the chat wasn't working again we have to contact YouTube about that. I hope this. Or let me know. Let me know. Send me an email over to HopeWorks, uh, Sean HopeWorks. Let me know how this was today. Um, but for now, let me just know. Let me let you know 
that the one thing I learned from Bertha Green was love is the light. Love is the answer. And at the end of the day, I do love you all. And even though we haven't met, I love you. I'm giving you my best. And I hope it makes an impact on your life. Have a beautiful day. Have a beautiful couple days. And we'll have a live stream next week. Um, bless you. Thank you very much. Watch the announcement board. Probably Thursday, Friday, I'll give you some update announcements. And I'll start grading some, some of your work. You'll have the grades by Sunday. And you'll be able to move forward. Take care, everybody.